I appreciate your typing into the discussion or or um, unmuting and saying here and then muting yourself back up again. Just remember, mute yourselves back up because if you don't, then um, it is not. I can't hear lots and lots of noise then. All right. Uh, are there any questions about anything that we've covered so far? How are you doing? Are you okay? Um, this is a psychology class, and I am a psychologist, so you know I'm not I'm not really trained to be the clinical psychologist, but I do care that you guys are trapped at home. Um, some of you with um, murderous little creatures called kids, you know. <laughs> So are there any questions, any problems? No, so far so good, excellent, great, glad to hear that. Um, I have a friend whose wife works at the hospital and um, it, she's probably gonna be one of the first ones to get it in this area because when somebody goes to the hospital, it just passes, it's very, very contagious. So then he'll get it, I'm pretty sure, but. Um, he is not one that's an older person or have any issues. So, um, on the other hand, I, being over 60 with pre-diabetic, pre-diabetes and, um, and sleep apnea, that causes issues. So, I certainly don't want to get it. Um, so, no questions, nothing. So, then we can just start where we left off then. All right. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, the stress and um, yes, you're a good boy. And we talked all the way down to number seven. And um, we were talking about catastrophes and uh, the stressors that it contains and that when somebody has a catastrophe that happens within them, um, there are catastrophic stressors, um, phases that we go through and we talked about um, the automatic phase, the communal phase where everybody comes together and the, um, the, in 9-11, all of the bicycles, cars, motorcycles, everything had a uh, American flag on it. That was definitely a communal effort. We all came together. And then there's the letdown and recovery phases. Um, people recover, but then some people recover slower than others do, and that means that uh, they feel let down by those people who have recovered and who and then of course that makes some of the recovery people um, have the um, feeling that why am I the one that that survived and that survival feeling that is an issue with some people too so this is uh, catastrophic stressors that's what happens with them uh, moving on from there um, talking about other types of stressors there are stresses that happen because you live in society. I mean, society causes stressors, um, and they can be all kinds of different things that happen in life that are caused by being in a society of other people. One of the things that um, is interesting is that today we have um, events that occur in our life that we cannot escape from, and those are the electronic events. We cannot get away from having to change our phones every two to three years. Our computers don't work after a while. We have to change them, and we're forced to make these changes, even though we're very comfortable with the phone and the computers that we have. Television sets are changing. There was a, there was a great commercial. Uh, a guy was waiting to get the best television, and he finally he, he decided on a 4K television, and the truck pulls up, to deliver his 4K television, and there's an advertisement on the side of the truck that says, 5K is here. <laughs> so you, you just forget it. You're never going to have the latest and greatest because it changes too fast. And those changes are things that can cause us stress. Um, here is the notice that I have here. Every 20 years or so, the typical way that we send out information changes. So the reel-to-reel -reel tape player in 1928, uh, I used to have a reel-to-reel -reel tape player and it was a big reel of tape and then you strung that tape through a machine and then you tied it to another reel and you were able to record your voice or listen to other people 
uh, who had recorded their voice. Um, and I used to record my favorite radio uh, shows on it. And then um, also I would record music off of the radio on it too. And I would have a tape that I could play my favorite um, types of music. Uh, that was 1928 when reel to reel tape players were invented. But in then 1948, just 20 years later, the record player was invented. And it didn't put the tape, the real real tape recorders out of business because you could buy a pre-recorded record, but you couldn't record on records. And so um, the real real tape players were still useful at that point. Then the cassette player um, in 1963, and it started to, it definitely put the reel-to-reel -reel tape player out of business because it was a reel-to-reel -reel tape player, but it was a pre-recorded one. You could sit into a cassette player, or you could put one that was not recorded. You could put it in there and you could record your own stuff. And I used to record things off of my old reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I would just record onto my um, cassette players. And then the CD player came out and sort of put everything else out of business. They don't even make the tape recorders anymore. Record, records are very rare. You can't find them very much anymore. Um, the cassette player, um, you basically don't buy cassettes anymore. And mainly it's because in 2001, the iPod MP3 player came out and it was a tiny little device. Instead of having to have that big monster on your, on your um, hip that you could stick a, a CD into or a cassette into, uh, now you had this little tiny device that you could sit in your front pocket and play on your ear pods anything that you were recorded on those iPods. So the iPod MP3 player put everything else out of business. And then, of course, um, the iPod itself. So I have it in my pocket. Do I have it? I have. Yes, I do have it in my pocket. Okay. Uh, this thing right here, um, of course, is a um, iPod as well. You can store all kinds of songs on it and listen to them. You can also talk to people on it. You also have a uh, camera which can record, rec so you can record stuff, um, video on it. You can also talk, um, play games on it. And this particular um, one, this is a Samsung J7, I think it is. Um, this Samsung J7 is more powerful than the first computer I ever bought my wife. My wife's computer was $2,500 when I bought it for her, and um, we were just dating at that time. So, But this is way more powerful and only cost me less than $100. Things change way too fast in our society. And there was a, a man who wrote a book back in 1970, and he was complaining about the pace of change in society. It was called Future Shock. Future Shock in 1970. And he was talking about how people in the 70s, in the 70s, were having nervous breakdowns because society was changing too fast in the 70s. Computers hadn't even been created yet for the personal computer yet, we were still using mainframes in those days and um, having uh, share time on mainframes if you were into computers at that point in your life. I was in 1976 when I uh, graduated from high school. We were doing share time on an IBM computer in Washington, DC. We had a certain number of hours that we could actually connect in and then we couldn't do anything else otherwise. So. Um, <laughs> There wasn't, how, how, is, how was change happening so fast in 1970 compared to today? Oh my God, our change of pace today is just insane. So if you look at uh, from 1837 when the telegraph was created, um, over 126 years of the changes that occurred, the telegraph in 1837, the telephone in 1877. So you could, you could send a telegraph to somewhere and send messages, sort of mail, an email almost, to somebody in another part of the country as long as they had a telegraph in their area and you had a telegraph in yours. 
and you could make the switches in between actually connect. And that was the interesting part, was making the switches connect. Well, the telephone in 1877, my great-grandmother refused to have a tele telephone in her house because she said it was the instrument of the devil. I mean, how could you pick up a phone in Chicago and talk to your relatives in Philadelphia? That was, there's something magical about that. And it's not a good thing as far as she was concerned. Um, that she did not want anything to do with the um, telephone. So that was my grandmother. Hold on one second. I am, I have lost, you all can still hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good, because I just lost my, um, my chat for some reason just disappeared. Why did that, there we go, thank you. All right, I got it back now. Let's There we go. All right. So uh, Corey says, not the devil. Uh, yeah, uh, the devil. Um, so uh, the AM radio was 1923. And actually, the AM radio has a connection to this area, the Outer Banks, the very first, uh, the very first government-sponsored radio broadcast happened from the Outer Banks for AM radio. The reel-to-reel -reel tape player, as I said, was 1928. The FM radio made AM radio sort of obsolete in 1937, only a few years after, what is that, 14, 15 years afterwards, um, the FM radio came out and put the AM radio out of business. TV was 1947. The record player was 1948, just one year after the television. And then the color television came out a little bit earlier than 1957, but you couldn't afford it. It was way too expensive. And eventually it came down in price. By 1957, anybody could buy a color television. And that was like, oh my gosh, how, how long ago was that? 1957, we can think, man, that was a long time ago. But I was born in 1957, people. I remember we did not have a television, color television, because it was too expensive. We had a black and white television in my house. And there were only three channels and they would go off the air about 11.30 at night, and they would play the national anthem. Um, are you all still there? Yes. Okay, good. I have a little message that said my um, network was a little bit um, discombobulated, but as long as you guys can still hear me, good. Uh, so uh, three channels 19, in 1957. Um, and my mom, she used to, when I was older, uh, I, would, I didn't want to go outside and play. I wanted to watch TV. So my mom in the morning, she would wake up before I did, and she would pull the tubes out of the television so that when I tried to turn it on, it wouldn't work, and I had to give up and go out to play. And then she would put the tubes back in the television. And um, when I came back in, then I could watch TV because it had miraculously started working again. So I actually, <laughs> I blame my mom for the fact that I have an electronics degree because I was always interested in why those things worked and why they didn't work. And now I have an electronics degree where I used to actually take them apart and put them back together again. It's all my mom's fault, <laughs> all my mom's fault. So um, nowadays, um, that particular, when I first got my degree, I used to fix people's televisions and fix people's VCRs and fix radios and, um, Today, there are no VCRs. People don't have them anymore um, because they don't even make VCR tapes anymore. We have DVDs instead, and people don't fix their DVD players or their televisions or radios. They just throw them out and buy a new one. If you're even lucky enough to have a, a radio, most people don't even have radios anymore except in their cars. So um, cassette recorders, 1963. That's 127, 126 years worth of change that occurred um, over two or three lifetimes, right? Two or three lifetimes. Well, then in one lifetime from 1980, 27 years, the VCR came about 1980. There are no VCRs anymore. Computers in 1981. Um, and as I told you, the computer that uh, came out in 1981, it's nothing compared 
to the phone that we have today. Um, the cordless phones in 1982, those were radio phones, giant monster things. You used to have a uh, antenna on your car to, to be able to use them. It looked like you were trying to reach a satellite in space. Um, the CD player, 1984, the cell phone in 1985, the true cell phone in 1985, camcorders in 1988, the pager came out in 1994. I hated pagers when I was working. It's just a little device that would hook to your belt and it would go off and, and when you looked at it, it would have uh, the phone number of somebody who was trying to get a hold of you and then hey, it was 1994, you could go to any corner of any place and you could get a public telephone. There's no such thing as public telephones anymore. You can't find them anywhere, uh, but you used to be able to then call whoever it was that called you to find out what it was that they wanted. It was usually my boss. So that was 1995. There isn't even, there are no such things anymore because this is now your pager and they can message you instant messaging and you better call your boss back if they instant message you. And they'll probably just call you and you better answer the phone if your boss calls you. The iPod MP3 player in 2001 and the iPhone in 2007. Most of you probably have, how many of you have iPhones instead of uh, Android? Does, does anybody have an iPhone in the class? So yeah, some of you do. Well, lots of you do. Um, what is the um, version of the iPhone you have? I think the highest version right now is the 11. <laughs> Madison has everything Apple. There's an X, XR. Those are pretty new also. I think that was version 10. There's an 11. McKinley has an 11. I think that's the newest. It's like $900 for that. You're very lucky to have that, McKinley. Um, so I think they're talking about coming out with the 12 very soon. But the iPhone came out in 2007. It's only been 13 years. They already have version 11 out. Talk about change, right? I mean, I have I have a phone, it's called the Mega. This is the J7. The Mega is about uh, one and a half times the size of this thing. It's huge, the Mega is big. Samsung made it for about two years and then didn't make it anymore, and they haven't upgraded it. It's a perfectly good phone. I love it because it's big and I can see it well, but no, they don't make it anymore, and not only that, they don't upgrade it anymore, so I'm forced, forced, to change, and that causes stress. I like my old phone, I like my computer, I don't want to change my computer, I don't, I liked um, Windows NT, forget about Windows um, 10, I don't like it, I didn't like Windows 8, Windows 7 was, eh, it was okay, but I'm, but we're forced to change over and over and over again, and that causes stress societal stress. There's nothing we can do about it. It's just that we live in a society and society changes. So you have to find ways to cope. And we'll talk about different ways of coping. Jessica, are you comparing me to your dad? I just, now I feel old. <laughs> so um, the ways of dealing with stressful situations is your coping strategies and you learn them from your relatives and you learn them from society. Um, they are used to reduce or eliminate the causes of stress or to reduce the stress itself. To cope, you have to face the stress. You cannot, you cannot deny stress. Um, he, uh, he, he, <laughs> he doesn't like change. Yeah, I don't like change at all. Uh, and here I am, and we're teaching now online. Uh, uh, so that's change, right? Um, I hope you all are coping well with this uh, change. Um, so you have to face it. You cannot deny it. Um, social supports are important. That means people that are friends um, that you know that you can rely on when something happens to you and you're stressed out. Your friends can help you. They can you know, take you out for drinks, or they can take you out to the movies, or they can do something. They know you, and they know what works for you to reduce your stress. But these are all fallback mechanisms. You cannot be stressed out and try to make a friend to help you because you're stressed out. And when you're stressed out, people don't want to be around you. Um, but the friends that you have 
already know that's not you, that's not the normal you, and so they will help you through it. So there are fallback mechanisms or social supports. Uh, cognitive restructuring means thinking about the problem in a different way. My mom always said, if, uh, if there's something negative happening in your life, then it's the devil poking you with a stick. And you should try to find a way to um, make it okay. You know, what did you learn from this event? What is funny about this event? Uh, but if you end up stressed out and it brings you down and, and knocks you out, um, then the devil's going to poke at you some more. So she says, always find the good things, find the useful things, and whatever happens to you, and the devil will go and poke somebody else instead. So that's my mother's way of thinking. Um, you can do physical exercise, lots of different ways to express, get out the energy that's being built up by the stress. And we'll also talk about ego defenses when your ego is under attack as well. Uh, hassles, this is actually your very last uh, discussion question in the class, is what are your five daily hassles, the five most um, interesting hassles that you have? I've already posted my five so you can see what they are, but um, right now actually this is a new hassle that we have to deal with, but um, the hassles are situations that just cause minor irritation or frustration. And it's the hassles in our life that actually cause us to go off on people. It's um, if you have a spouse and um, your spouse is not paying the attention to you that you think they should, and you have some sort of, in the back of your head, they're seeing somebody else, um, they're, they're um, cheating on me, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. And you don't want to... Um, face it because one, it's going to cause a massive um, reaction if they are. And um, if they aren't, you're going to look silly. Um, so you don't want to deal with it. You try not to deal with it. And then they leave the top off the toothpaste and you just jump all over them about how you're supposed to put the, why, how many times have I told you to put the top on the toothpaste, screw it in, you're going to ruin the toothpaste, it's going to dry the toothpaste out, and it's like, oh gee, you're going to have to buy another $5 for the toothpaste. But you, you just, yes, kids count. Yeah, so you just have to, um, um, I count my, my cats, Jessica, so yeah, kids count too. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's the hassles. We use the hassles to get rid of all that stress that's building up in our lives. And we jump all over people, which is not good. We should not. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the ego defenses as well. But we exaggerate the little problems in our life, the hassles in our life. Uh, the social readjustment scale is a little test that I've put out there for you to take. It's not for a grade, but it does give you a number when you take it. And it's a psychological rating scale that's designed to measure your stress level. And what it does is it um, you you are saying yes or no to different things that have happened in your life. So they are um, events that are evaluated. Each one has a different score. The loss of a spouse is a huge score. You, um, it takes seven and a half years to get over the loss of a spouse and the loss of a child. Um, and uh, divorce is a big one, but so is marriage. You, you know, it's stressful. I'm, it's a wonderful, happy, loving thing, but it is stressful when you get married. Um, so there are good things and bad things that cause us stress in our life. And this is just a list of a whole bunch of things that you could um, click on and say, this happened to you. And you have to decide whether you're going to do it for a six month period or a one year period. If you do it for six months, then you only mark the things that have happened within the last six months. And if you do it for a year, you mark anything that's happened to you within the last year. Changing jobs, moving um, to a different house, uh, rent, you know, changing rentals, uh, going to school, starting school. That's a big thing, too. So if you've done it, done this social readjustment rating scale, and you did it for a six-month period of time, and your total calculation comes out to be 300, or if you did it for a one year period of time and it comes out to be a 500, then you are in a great deal of stress. That's a huge number. 
and you need to find ways to reduce the stressors in your life or get rid of them or find ways to reduce the stress in your life. And we'll talk about different ways to reduce stress in your life in this chapter. So take the readjustment rating scale and um, uh, let me know what it is that you get um, when you take the scale. Um, you can post it maybe in uh, one of the forums that I put out there for us to talk back and forth on. Um, not the technical school, technicals forum, but a different forum. I can't remember what its name is. What is the name of that forum? Um, anyway, there's a forum out there for you to talk on, so you can post it on there. Uh, there is such a thing as good stress. Some stress is useful, and we actually have a name for it. It's called eustress. And for the stress that's bad for you, we call that distress. So eustress is actually um, a little amount of stress that happens in our life all the time, just because we're alive, we have stress in our life. But it's okay stress, it's not, it doesn't debilitate you, it actually enhances your ability to fight the problems in life. It's sort of like charging your battery up. If, if any of you have ever had a, um, a weekend where there was nothing you had to do. You know, your, your parents had the kids, your um, spouse is off doing something else. Um, you don't have any homework you had to do. And you just say, you know, today I'm not doing anything. And you never get out of your pajamas and you just watch TV all day long. You eat, that's about it. You don't do anything. And then you, um, it's nighttime. You're ready to go to bed, you turn off the television, you have a headache, and you feel tired. You feel tired. How can you be tired? You haven't done anything all day. And the reason you feel tired is because you haven't done anything all day and there's, no, there's been no stress in your life and we need a little bit of stress in our life to keep our batteries functioning, to keep our body up and ready and um, available for any bad things that might happen. Um, if you use, if you have a device that is battery operated and you have it on and you just let it wear itself all the way down um, and you just let it sit at the bottom of its, um, of its charge for a long period of time and then you try to charge it up all the way, it will say it's 100% charged, but it's only 100% of what it can, can now charge because batteries that aren't used decrease the amount of energy that they can hold. You have to recharge it and keep it going and recharge it and keep it going. Um, that's the same thing with us. We need to have something continuously happening in our life to keep ourselves ready for those times when something bad might happen. So that's eustress, good stress. There are two very specific types of stress, distress. They are acute distress and chronic distress. So acute distress is something that happens and it's over, or you can start it and you know exactly when it's going to end. So uh, the temporary pattern of arousal caused by a stressor with a clear onset and offset is an acute stressor. Uh, you can easily mobilize energy because you know you can see how long it's going to take, you know how much energy you have, and you can quantify, this is how much energy I need to get through this process. It's sort of like school. School is a process um, that is an acute stressor. You know that you're going to spend two years in your associate degree, or you're gonna spend one year in your certificate program, and you're gonna go out and get a job. And then after your two years, um, some of you will go out and get a job with your associate degree, or you'll go on to college, um, university, and get two more years to get a bachelor's degree and go on to get a job. Some of you may be planning to go for another two years for a master's degree. And I tell all my students, if you get your master's, don't stop. Go two more years and get your PhD because the PhD opens up a huge number of jobs for you. You have so many more possibilities with the PhD and it's only two more years. Stick it out. If you're going for that master's degree, stick it out. I wish I had. I wish I had gotten at 62. It's just not in the cards anymore. But um, I've looked at getting another master's degree, um, but the PhD, just doing the research and all the other stuff, um, 
um, taking care of the family, you know, that's another thing. Also, if you're young, um, you can get married, but don't have a family until you're finished with your PhD. Um, get that PhD, then have your family. Um, that's your acute stress. Uh, chronic stress is a continuous state of stressful arousal that persists over a long time, and you have no idea when it's going to end. I have um, a, I get, I have a child that has um, mongoloidism, you know, um, so trisomy 21. I, 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 I how am I going to deal with this? I'm going to have to deal with my child all their life, and. And for most children, you think, okay, you've got 18 years. No, that's not. That's just ridiculous because they'll be 20 and still coming back home to do, to do their clothes and um, to get fed. And um, they'll be in college and coming back to you for the uh, same things. Um, so, and then they're going to go out and they're not going to have uh, success and they're going to come back home again. You're with children for the rest of your life. But that's not something we consider when we have a child and then you have a child that has an issue like Down syndrome and oh good lord what's going to happen and you don't know how much energy it's going to take to take care of this child and you just it's a chronic stressor it's a chronic stressor um, it can be very hazardous because you don't know how much energy you need to put into it and you can wear yourself out easily and you can fake yourself out thinking that you are doing okay and we'll talk about that in the gas syndrome in just a second. It's nearly impossible to determine how much energy to use to fight the stress and because we don't know how long it's going to last. That's a chronic stressor. For the acute stressor, a good example of that is the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Uh, something happens in our environment. We have, a, uh, we have a car backfire and, oh, we have this reaction. It's a reflex reaction that we go into fight, flight, or freeze response. But we know almost immediately, oh, it's a car backfiring. It's done. We're done. We don't have to worry about it. And again, um, I already taught, told you school is a good acute stressor as well. The um, general adaptation syndrome is what happens when somebody gets into a chronic stressful situation and, and can't get out of it. So the general adaptation syndrome, or gas syndrome, is a psychosomatic uh, symptoms that are painful physical symptoms and increased susceptibility to colds exist during this particular gas syndrome. Uh, and the flu is, a, is easier to catch because you're in this syndrome, your, your immune system is compromised. And uh, it ca is caused by an increased physical arousal. You, your body's metabolism is high as it fights this stress, whatever it is, and the stressor that, that's existing in your life. And we see it take a three, generally three-stage pattern of physical responses. Now, remember with the catastrophic stressor, there were five stages, but you could go into any of those stages at any time and go back to a stage that you had passed through. So it isn't that they're in order. This is in order. You follow this in order from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. And this is what it looks like. So we have an alarm reaction. Uh, that is where the stressor exists. And we have our primary appraisal of, oh my gosh, how am I going to deal with this thing? And that's our alarm reaction. It mobilizes our resources. We cope with the stressor. We try to figure out how we're going to deal with it. But it is a chronic stressor, so there's no real way out of the stressor. And we end up in the resistance phase. The resistance phase, in that phase, the body seems to adapt to the presence of the stressor. We think, hey, we're doing okay. We've got this stressor in our life, but we're working through it. We're doing everything we're supposed to do, so we must be okay. But we're not okay because we're still dealing with it. Our body is still dealing with it. Our metabolism is still higher than it should be. We're, you, we're working, working out, we're working out all of that stress but um, it keeps building up in us all the time. So we end up then in an exhaustion phase where we've lost all of our energies. All of our energies are gone. And in the exhaustion phase, our immune system is compromised. So all of our systems are depleted. And if we catch a cold or if we get a 
a simple cut that should be taken care of by our immune system, it can become gangrene. Um, the cold can end up in pneumonia or worse. Um, things that we would, in the normal environment, we would have been able to get through, we can't get through it, we get that particular disease, whatever it is, because our systems are compromised. And there are different stories that demonstrate this. So in the resistance phase, during the resistance phase of the gas syndrome, a new stressor can actually cause the body to give out. And this is the saying, the straw that broke the camel's back. How many of you have heard that saying before, the straw that broke the camel's back? Anybody? Some of you have. Yes, some of you have heard of it. Um, but what does it really mean? We know that a piece of straw cannot break a camel's back. A piece of straw is, doesn't weigh much of, of anything. But if you have loaded that camel down, with all your gold and silver as you're trying to go somewhere, that camel has got as much as it can hold and one little piece more, just one little coin more, and that is too much weight and the camel falls to the ground because it just cannot handle it. And it's the same thing with us when we're in the resistance phase, we're handling as much as we can and, and it seems like we're fine. We don't even realize that we're in the resistance phase. And then something comes along and smacks us and we just break, we break. And uh, my major professor when I was getting my master's degree, he was pretty old when I was take, getting that degree. So, um, and that was a long time ago. He told a story that, that perfectly demonstrates this. And it was from his life. This is a true story from his life. Uh, he lived when roads were just dirt roads. And the dirt roads had, um, had the bushes along the roads so that the water, when it rained, wouldn't wash the dirt away. It would stay in. The bushes would keep the dirt there. Um, and he had a choke on his car. Now, a choke is you pull the choke out, you start the car up, it allows the gasoline to go through, and then you push the, the choke, choke back in, and you have a, and your car runs fine. But if you pull the choke out and push it in while the car is running, it backfires. You have a, a backfire of the car. Sounds like a gunshot, right? Well, he used to go out just after dark, and he would um, drive along the road, and the, the rabbits will have gone to sleep in the bushes and when he's driving along the road it's a noise a massive monsters coming and it wakes the the rabbits up because they haven't hit their deep sleep and they jump out and start running well to run away from this thing well rabbits do not jump into the darkness they jump in where they can see his lights are on so they jump in front of the car and they start running in front of the car now, they're running in front of the car, but the car is um, just behind them. He doesn't run them over. He just runs them a little while. The rabbit's thinking, ah, oh, there's this monster following me, but I'm okay. I'm all right. It's not catching me. I'm doing okay. And then he pulls the choke out, pushes the choke in. The car backfires, and the rabbit dies of a heart attack. He stops the car, goes, picks it up, and goes chase the next one. And that's how he hunted. <laughs> That's, that's how he hunted. Now, um, that is a good example of the straw that broke the camel's back. That, that animal thinks it's doing fine. It's got a huge amount of stress in its life, but it thinks it's doing okay because it's keeping away from this whatever monster it is. And then that other thing comes along and bang, it's too much. And he dies of a heart attack. And that can happen to us as well, human beings when we're too stressed out and we're not able to control the stresses and the chronic stressor. The last phase of the chronic stressor is the exhaustion phase. And this is sad, but this is the reason Kermit the Frog died. Jim Henson was the voice of Kermit the Frog and he created the Muppets and it was his baby. And he wanted this thing to be everywhere. And he wanted it to be the biggest thing ever. And he was putting on television. It was on radio. It was in movies. It was all over the world. He was going to different places. And he was pushing, 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 pushing. 
and his friends and relatives all said, you need to take a break, you need to take a vacation, but he couldn't. It was just all about this thing he needed to do. And he caught basically the common cold. He had no energy left in him. He was in the exhaustion phase. And, you know, doctors can help us a certain amount, but really, if you are, if you are too exhausted, if you do not have the reserves to help fight, the doctors can't give you those reserves and there's no way they can help you. You have to help the doctor to cure yourself. The doctor helps you to cure yourself. And it, he just was too far gone. And um, we lost Jim Henson because of the exhaustion phase of the general adaptation syndrome. Do y'all get that? Do you understand that? Does it make sense? See, yes from Jessica, right? Is anybody else there? Nobody else is responding. Oh, there we go. All right, all right, good. <laughs> good, all right. So um, this connection between stress and the immune response, there's actually a, a group called psychoneuroimmunology. It's a new field that studies the influence of our mental states on the immune system. And we know that people who are optimistic have better operating systems, uh, immune systems than <laughs> operating systems, thinking about computers. Um, <laughs> immune systems have better immune systems than those people who are pessimistic. But I can't make a pessimist into an optimist. However, I can help the pessimist to be less pessimistic. And maybe that will help them in their immune systems. Uh, immunosuppression is the diminished effectiveness. It's the word that means the diminished effectiveness of the immune system. It's caused by impairment or suppression of the immune response through numerous reasons. Um, we have also learned that suppression of the immune system can be classically conditioned, meaning we can learn to, to um, improve or, um, or destroy our immune system. So it can either be active or inactive and we control it. And I know that is hard for some people to believe because they don't wanna believe that they are in control of their own immune systems, um, but it is, it's, it is under our control, our immune systems. Be happy to be healthy, be happy to be healthy, learn ways to get rid of your stress and um, giggle and laugh sometimes, find ways to um, improve your well-being. And that's why this is called stress, health and well-being chapter. So how do we respond to stress? Our psychological responses under stress depend on personality, the things that we've been taught also, um, our perception of that particular event and the ways we've learned to respond by seeing other people respond in specific ways. Psychosomatic illness is stress-induced body pains. You know, um, I tell my wife all the time, how? She says, what's the matter? I say, phantom pain. I have no idea what it is, right? Of course, there's eustress. We know that that's good stress. I've already talked about eustress. Um, and we're coming close to the end of this um, 50 minutes, so let's stop here at number 18, slide number 18 and pick it back up again when we come back next time. Are there any questions? Um, did everybody get your uh, tests done? Did anybody have any problems getting the tests done? Ah, the thumbs up, yeah. Uh, my participants is over top of my, I couldn't see that. Um, Hazel, your thumbs up. Um, but hey, I can see you now. You're playing with your camera. So are there any questions? Um, did any, if anybody had a problem, let me know. Uh, we're in a really strange time here. So if you um, have an issue, please let me know what that issue is. And um, I, I will try to find a way around it. We, I'm, I'm here to help. Uh, no, uh, younger people deal with stress in different ways than older people do. And we'll actually talk about that in this uh, unit as well. Um, younger people like to fix the problem and older people uh, tend to fix the emotion. Well, I don't have a problem with this particular issue, so it's not an issue. Uh, but young people go, the issue exists and therefore we need to fix it. And older people go, no, not really, it doesn't bother me, so who cares? 
So um, yeah, we, we deal with things differently. And that's one of the things that causes generation gaps, you know, the generation gap, the reason why older people and younger people don't seem to hit it off sometimes. Um, but if you have any problems, I can intercede between you and another teacher or you and the administration, you know, if there's something, I will try my best to help you. So let me know. If you have any problems, send me emails. Uh, if not, um, if you don't have any problems right now, then I will see you all on Wednesday. Stay healthy. Talk to you later. Bye.